just some of the experiences. Ed and I were just talking about we've known each other. He said when he walked in, I I saw him and I, he says, you know, we've known each other for 60 years. And then he just tells me, he says, no, that isn't right. We've known each other for 70 years and that's when we were poor. So I don't know uh, if he's rich, I'm poor. Uh, a lot of things haven't changed. Anyway, Ed, we're going to talk about it and I'm glad you're here because they want me to talk about the flat plane crankshafts. What know, kind of crank? The flat plane. This, ugh. Let me get my. Is it from the raw billet or? Yeah, we have, you know, the, the latest and greatest, uh, the Ford Coyote engines, oh, yeah. you know, have a flat plane crank in them. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And, yeah. and you know, going back, uh, in history, the first flat plane crank I uh, ran into, and I restore and have antique cars and things, and the first V8 that I found a flat plane crank in was when I restored my 1915 Cadillac. Mm. And all the original V8 engines, as you know, had, had, the, flat had, had the flat plane cranks. Single plane, flat Single plane, plane cranks, cranks, right. And uh, you and I have shared some interesting stories about that and there's there's one story because you know that i've restored will st Clair's, and you and your sidekick john athens knew that the will st Clair was a pretty hot item in the 20s right yeah yeah the b8 especially yeah yeah and so you and john decided that you were going to go get a will st Clair because you thought it was performance tell us what happened with that well when they went to get that b8 st Clair. Uh, they couldn't get that, they were rare. Yeah. But they found an overhead cam six uh, Will yeah. St. Clair. And uh, we took it apart and we thought, overhead cam, oh, that, that makes it fast. But we didn't realize a rocker arm engine could be good fast too. Right. Uh, so, uh, John, my friend John, who uh, says I know grammar school, he polished all the uh, followers, and uh, we started it up and made flames, and and uh, that's as far as we got. And then we had a friend named Eddie Bolts, and he, and this is going to be a hot rod. We're going to use this right. in a 27T hot rod. Right. This be right. six, the six cylinder engine. He goes, he finds one for sale, a used one, and he brought it over and he gives us a ride in it. And we were so disappointed. It wasn't any faster than a Chevy 6. <laughs> so, uh, we, we fight, so we never went further with the hot rod with that Will St. Clair engine. And then we were so surprised when you knew about the Will St. Clair. Yeah, and, imagine that. And, yeah. And, well, you know, the, the Will St. Clair um, is a relatively rare car, and I've restored uh, four from my own uh, and four cars for other people. And in the back, there's the world's largest uh, stash of spare parts for the Will St. Clairs. I've got extra engines, and I got the engine that you wanted that you never got. Oh. So, the anyway, V8. the V8. Oh. And, and the V8, this is 1921 now. I mean, you guys think that you're hot riders. You know nothing. The bottom line is flat plane crank, right? Overhead cam, cam followers. The valve train would be any valve train that's similar to the rocker arms of today, right? Uh huh, right. And um, all of the other engines, like my Cadillac, my Cadillac had roller tappets. They had a rocker arm, even though it was a flathead, they, if you remember the old Cadillacs had the rocker arm that came off the tappet and stuff. That's roller. Um, all of the stuff that you guys, you know, you come here and you listen to these guys talk about all this hoopla, all this stuff was done 100 years ago. And so... By the way, how is it if I talk to five stuff? Is it better or worse? Can you hear better with the... With my loud voice or uh, better with the microphone? With the microphone. With the microphone. The microphone. microphone. microphone will better. Okay. Okay. They have a hearing problem too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
Let's see. Uh, now here's the talking about these flat cranks. That that made the V8 engine smooth. And if you put a flat crank in a V8, you, you'll shake the fenders like a Model A Ford at 2,000. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're right. Well, and this new engine with the flat crank V8, is it running smooth or? Yes. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. They got rid of that. Uh, well, and I'll show you. Uh, Ed, right here. This is a uh, a typical flat plane crank. This crank. I don't know how long ago we made this, but it was when Ford was one, running Indy. And this is one of the Indy car Ford cranks that we made, you know, a long time ago. And uh, you'll notice that it looks similar to a, a four-cylinder crankshaft that you'd see on any regular four-cylinder engine. Right. And so if you notice the position of the throws, it's up, down, 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 and then up. Yes. Now the new uh, way of doing things is this crank. Uh, do you, are you familiar with the Koenigsegg, the supercar built in Sweden? Mm -hmm. Through the big V8 no, no, in Indianapolis. No, the the Koenigsegg, the new carbon fiber car that's built in in uh, Sweden, the Koenigsegg. No, I don't know about it. Well, it's a two million dollar car. Uh, it holds the world's record on the. Nevada, what is it, the Nevada? That big Nevada race. Right. Uh -huh. One of these crankshafts that Scott made was in one of those cars, and it, I think the, the average speed for the 30-some miles was 289 miles an hour. Oh, you're kidding. On a highway, yeah, oh, imagine. Yeah. yeah. Now you notice this crank, the, the throws are positioned one up, one down, one up, one down, and then it has counterweights on each end. And what happened with this is, oh, yeah. you see that? Yes. Well, that took the rocking coupling out of it. When you've got, and I'm gonna set this down because, yeah, it's, it's kinda, anyway, what happens with this crank, because of the two throws in the center, it wants to jump rope yeah. like this, and that's your vibration. And you can change any of the weights of the counterweights around, you can do whatever you want, but it's not gonna work. These are a problem. These I heard that Crower made one like that, and they, they were doing real good in the race with the Chevy with that crank, type of crank, and then uh, they got out of the race. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, passed away now. Anyway. Yeah, that was yeah. quite a while ago. That was back yeah. in the... So that is not a good idea. No, this is the good, this is the latest idea. This is really? A, yeah. Yeah. That does work. Well, what happens is, is that because the two throws are opposite like this, yes. what happens is this throw counteracts that throw. Oh, that's right, and, that, and, and there again. And, there and, again. and back and forth. The two end counterweights are to balance the crank itself, that's end right. for end, but the two throws in the center on each end, these balance each other. And then the, the thrust, depending on where the thrust is on the engine, that controls things too. Who's using that now? This is the typical of the Ford Coyote, the new Ford crank. Oh. And then oh, also... It's a flat crank all right, but right. a different way of doing a flat right. crank. And then Chevrolet and the new Corvette has come out with the same design. So you don't need to pull oh my no. goodness. Now what's see that? So Crower had the right idea. All of us he guys had those gone. ideas. Uh -huh. You know, we're smarter than those guys, you know that, right? Did you make it for him by any chance? Me make the Crower crank? Uh, <laughs> what do you think, guys? you think that happened? I don't think so. There's something good about that. There must be a balance problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, John, can you talk to us about balancing, whether it's 50 50 or if it's like a 2% overbalance or what requirements for the to make it work? It's none of that. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. What the question was is how you balance the crankshaft, whether you use the bob weight and what the bob weight value is. Whenever you have a crankshaft that does not have uh, throws in, a, in, in two planes, if it's a single plane crank, the crank is always balanced as a shaft. 
And so these cranks are balanced as a shaft, and that's one of the things that you could bolt counterweights on this. And if the counterweights are symmetrical, if they're all the same, if you balance the crank and then you put the counterweights on it, it comes out the same because everything is counteracted and all you're doing is making the crank heavier and the balance machine just picks up whatever the balance is with that weight. So that's not the way you balance a flat plane crank. Now, the, Ed, this is something that these guys don't know. The, the reason most of you don't know what the advantage is of a flat plane crank. On a, on a flathead board V8? Well, you know, back in the days, you remember Norton Manufacturing? They made the flat plane crank for the midgets, right? Yeah, yeah. That ran at Gilmore. Norton, Norton, Norton yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he came over one day with the Model B Ford, and I, I looked out the window and I saw it shake it up. Yeah. I said, oh, you got a Model B Ford Soder in there. No, that's a V8. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put the flat crank. You know, I've got one of those engines in the, you know, I collect the, you know, cars and stuff, and I, I've got one of those engines when, when Scat in 1973 started the Volkswagens and the Midgets, you know, the, the, we took over. I mean, that year in USAC, we entered 14 races, won 14 races, and the guys at USAC, they were a little upset with the little old engine maker in Redonda Beach that we took the Midwest guys and they had to buy a new race car, a new engine, a new everything. So what happened was, is, you know, me being, you know, a, a bit of a pack rat or whatever, when somebody came in with a, a race car or an engine that was kind of interesting, I'd take it in on trade on the engine. And so at one time I had the building next door here, that was full of old race cars. I had over 50 old race cars in there. And one of them was one of those Norton engines that, that you're talking about. And I yeah. still got it. I'll be dying. Wonderful. Charlie so, Norton. Charlie, I think it was Charlie, yeah. But the real, the real reason, and this may take and jar your, your brains a little bit, the real reason for a flat plane crank is because on a 90 degree engine, you know the engines have to be even fired, right? So yes, uh -huh. if, if it's a V8, you fire every 90, no, there's two, 90, 720 even. divided by eight, it's right. every 90 degrees, right? Yeah. So. If you take the time and you look at a modern V8 engine, take any engine you want with a 90 degree crank in it, and you look at the firing order down the one bank, mm -hmm. it's not an even fire engine, it's an odd fire engine. Yeah. It fires 90, 180, 270, 180 back to zero. So all these guys that have been making headers for all these years and they give you the big ballyhoo about equal length and blah, 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 blah. They haven't got a clue what they're talking about. The bottom line is, you know, Ed, the mixture is a mass, right? I mean, in other words, when you start talking about fluids and mixtures and things like that, it's a mass. It takes time to move from point A to point B. So when you talk about a collector on a header, then what happens is, is if you're firing, if the next cylinder is firing at 90 degrees, and the next cylinder after that is firing at 180 degrees, it's impossible for them with equal length to get to the collector at the same time. Right? Yeah. And then the one, and the one at 90 gets there too soon, the one at 180 gets there on time, the one at 270 is late. So to use a header for tuning doesn't make any sense. So there were a couple different ways that people did this. The only header guy that understood that, you remember Stahl? Stahl yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. If you looked at his headers, he had, he picked a length at the 180 firing and he said that was, there are four cylinders that fire at 180. Right? Yeah, that's right. That was the length he picked. And then the cylinders that fired at 90, he increased the length by a third. So if he had a 30 inch pipe, then that pipe was a third longer. It was 40 inches. And then the, the cylinder that was 270 had to be a third less. So instead of 30 inches, it was 20. And when we were doing the V4 engines, and we built uh, the Volkswagen engines, we built about 5,000 engines over 
over that period of time from 1973 to 1985, somewhere in there. And then when I came out with the V4 engine, you remember that one? Yeah. When I came out with that, we built about 360 of those engines. Really? And I could never get, because that engine had the odd firing order, the only way I could get any power out of an exhaust system was to follow what Stahl did. What was that? But the, to get the power out of it, we made the headers with different lengths. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, to make it happen. Now, I've got a question for you. I mean, it, the guys that knew knew about all this, and the guys that didn't, didn't. For instance, the guys at Edelbrock, the way they, Jim McFarland and a guy by the name of George Bay, I don't know if you remember George Bay, the head engineer at Holly. Anyway, oh, yeah, no, I didn't know. Can't yeah, remember. Yeah, but anyway, those guys, and of course, you, you had some of these engines on your dyno. I thought you were going to say Bobby Meeks. Bobby well, Meeks. <laughs> he was there too. Yeah. But they they came up with the tunnel ram. You remember the tunnel ram? Oh, yeah, ran, yeah. You ran Bones, ran a lot of those on your dyno, right? Yeah. And so what they did to compensate for it is they took and they came up with, you remember the the plenum chamber that they used on the ram, you know, the tunnel ram manifold that they yeah. designed. Yeah, yeah. So what they did is they knew that four cylinders were working together and four cylinders were not because of the, the firing sequence. Yeah. So what they tried to do is with the tunnel ram, and this is the advent, this is where the plenum chambers today, and most people don't have any idea where all this stuff came from, but what they did is getting the the mixture under the vacuum of the butterfly, getting it in a chamber, they took the four cylinders that were operating properly and averaged them with the other cylinders that weren't. Uh -huh. And so what happened is, you know, horsepower went up, right? Yeah. Now the question for you is, and this is something I've been meaning to ask you in all these 60, 70 years because of this, when you guys were grinding cams, did you ever grind cams that had a different profile on some of the cylinders than other to compensate for some of this flow and so forth? Uh, yeah, really to compensate for a big block Chevy with a different port for every other port was different, you know? Right. Uh, and we, we took a guess at it. So it was, which flows better, this one? And, as the end thing comes in, does he hits a wall? Which flows better, that one or the one that goes over to our exhaust and looks like it flows right. better? But maybe we're wrong. Maybe the one that hits the wall is better. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we got away with it. And uh, there's, we, there's some funny things that happen that uh, I need. I got some other stories too. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, well. I, uh, you're you're the master. You continue. <laughs> so uh, let's see. You you talk, and I'll think of that good example. Okay. So basically, the other people in the business that knew about this, and of course the hot rod guys, you have probably have never heard these stories. But the real solution, and the reason the flat plane crank is is coming on stream now, is because that's the only solution. You've got to have the firing to the header has got to be, and, and what you have with the flat plane crankshaft is you've got two four cylinder engines that are even fire that are hooked together by a common crank hitch. So when you build a header now, you can build an equal length header because it's firing 180, 180, 180, 180, and the collector is going to work. It's going to scavenge, and you're going to jump start the intake cycle because the exhaust system on all of those four cylinders on each side of the engine now are working in unison with each other. And that's the reason for the flat plane crank. And that's the reason that they made the tunnel ram, because that was before guys like us could make a crankshaft. And, you know, they knew about it, but there wasn't any way for the people to do it because the cost of the crankshafts was so expensive. Mm -hmm. But you remember the day when I bought, when you go back into the shop today, we have a, two machines back there that are called a GFM. It's a crankshaft milling machine. And I bought this thing in 1980, and I bought it based on Ford coming to me and telling me that Bo Snowen, the head of, of uh, 
engineering, performance, and you remember Mo's, Mo's at, at Ford, of course. And mm -hmm. they uh, were going back into racing with the Elliots. Remember, you know, Bill Elliott and, and Ernie Elliott and uh, of course the whole and Moody crowd and all that. And they were going back into racing and Mo's met me at the SEMA show and he told me, he says, look, he says, Tom, you make crankshafts. We want you to make cranks for Ford and you'll have all of our business if you buy this machine. You know, my big machine back there, right? And you took a chance. Well, and, uh, let me tell you about the chance because I'm going to ask you about this. The, the machine, now in the, we moved from Englewood to this building. Uh, the last day of move in was October 15th, 1975. It was the last, when we moved from Englewood, when you were just down the street from us, and then yeah. you moved to Gardena, yeah. and we moved here. But in 1975, we moved in here, and Vic Edelbrock, you know, I grew up with Vic, and he's, well, he's four, he's passed away, but he's four years older than I am, or was four years. Anyway, he was in the construction business in those days, and he built this building for me on a handshake. Oh, he built this, uh -huh. And so when I opened my mouth, you know, I'm 40 some years old, whatever, when we're having breakfast, and Moe's bought it, by the way, so that was a good breakfast. And what happened was, I opened my mouth, and I said, yeah, I'll buy one of those machines. Of course, Moe's, I'll take care of it. How much? The machine, and this was the eye opener, the machine was twice the cost of what it cost me to build this building. Oh. And it's sitting back there. And you were, I don't know if you remember this, but you were amazed by that. And you were one of the first guys to come here to take a look at that machine to find out what the hell I did. Yeah, it was a great new idea because the, the two bits were the inside of this big wheel that went around the crank. Yeah. That was amazing. What, yeah. Well, that put us in the crank business, and after that, we furnished everybody. I mean, Callies, Lenati, even Crowler. That's when Crowler bought things for me. Uh -huh. And we furnished blanks to all of these guys because we were the only guys that could take and remove material. What we did in an hour, the other guys took three days. And that first machine was half the price to the second machine you got. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's a story, we don't have time for the story to tell you how I, how I kited checks and ran around the block and all the things that I did to pay for all this stuff. But, you know, the, the guys in the early days, Ed, and of course, you're, you're a testament to that, we just did whatever we had to do. We didn't have enough common sense to figure out that what we were doing made absolutely no sense. It was a gamble that, that was really, you know, far-fetched and... You know, talking about things like that, Ed, when you started in cam grinding, you couldn't buy a cam grinder. No, you uh, you had to build your own. Winfield showed me his machine when I went to buy a cam from him, and he was nice enough to show me the machine. He had built the attachment, which he put on a regular cylindrical grinder, and I was amazed. So that's the way it's done. Wow. And you just think you could try different profiles, and uh, it's not, you found a symbol on the something. Yeah. And uh, so after the war, uh, I didn't know, but he would have helped me. But uh, I, I thought I was interfering with his business, but he was kind of retired now. So I, with, with just the apprenticeship training in a machine shop, I could build that cam grinding attachment. And I built that, and uh, I looked at a book, and they saw I saw that the cams were designed with a base circle, a radius for the opening side, a radius for the closing side, and another radius blending the nose together, and a clearance ramp. Every, for maybe 15 or 20 degrees of cam rotation, one thousandths per degree increase in that. And I left that off because that's going to take a little extra work. So I made my first cam by a series of radiuses. And I didn't know it, but a kid was building a, uh, his own V8, uh, his Right. And he bought a cam with me from me for 20 bucks <laughs> uh, with no reputation at all. That, that trial cam that uh, I tried to machine out with, 
and I could hear him coming half a block away the tapping noise. Oh, I was ashamed of that. But that's what made that flathead run nice and crisp and clean and, and, and NASCAR loved it. They thought I was smart when they bought two of those cams. They saw my little two inch ad in Hot Rod Magazine. Right. And uh, these, this was not a very well known or a very, uh, uh, they, they're newcomers in NASCAR. Well, you weren't famous then. Huh? You weren't famous then. And, but now when they put that cam in, they went better than they used to than the other guys. What do you do to your car? You're running better now. Oh, we bought a cam from Misky on the telephone. <laughs> yeah, but, and I, I pretty sure I had to be, and they thought I was smart. I was just lucky, you know. <laughs> well, if you go in your, in those days. when you go in your shop today, you have, uh, I think your favorite grinder of choice to do that with was the Norton grinders. Yeah. And, and you have several Norton grinders with the beds that you cast and you made the, the cam attachment, attachment yeah. and everything. You've got Esky cams on them. And, and, yeah. But you never sold any of that stuff to your competitors, did you? No. And uh, now, we're, now that's obsolete too because uh, we bought that million dollar machine. Well, that's where I was headed. I want you to invite me over to see that. You came over here to see my fiasco. I want to come over and see yours, and I'll buy you lunch at the burger joint. And now uh, we, we can't afford to do it the old-fashioned way. We can't get anybody that wants to work, first of all. And uh, so just oddballs are done on the old side with the old grinders, hand hand uh, hand run machines, right. you know. Right. So. Uh, but how's it feel to to take a look at those old grinders? that you've been using for your lifetime that is, you know, has done what it's done. And then you look at this new machine that's sitting over there that, it, you know, I know the value of that machine in relationship to the world at large. And I know that that machine is, uh, you know, a very, very expensive machine, but here you've lived all these years and you've gone from, from what you learned with Winfield and now you're in the, the I don't know, are we in the 21st or 22nd century? I don't know where we are. Yeah. And, and now you're there, so you've seen everything. I mean, you've seen there are all these things happening. Yeah. How, do you, how do you feel about that when you walk in the shop and you, you think about your life and where you've done and how you've made all these things and you had your ideas and you tried them and so forth, and now somebody can come in and instead of having all that creativity, they just take their, their calculator or whatever, that, their computer, and they can change a profile like that where you had to actually make a master and you yeah, had to file it right. and polish yeah. it and all that. That's, that's got to be a life changer for you. Yes, it's uh, helped a lot. And, and everybody's gotten lazy and that's why they like to, to, to make it masters the old hard way. It was a tedious job and now, uh, now everything is figured on the computer yeah. and so forth. It makes it a lot simpler. Oh, well, let me tell you this. My son says, uh, we got to make the cams a new way with radius, with the uh, with uh, proper acceleration and velocity and so forth and all that. And this company in Santa Monica has the machine we need for $4,000. And we bought it. And he would tag, because oh, each time he went one degree up, He's got to watch the acceleration. No, that we're just, let's try this figure. And okay, that, that's reasonable. So gradually we're building very really carefully and a big long tape. And later that became obsolete. Uh, but uh, I go to an auction of machinery at the aircraft factory and I bid on some machines. And they had some machines that looked like the ones we bought in Santa Monica for 4000 I put $7 a piece out of it. <laughs> and I got them. I got them home and my son said, oh, this is, a, this is a later serial number. There's the one we get. I'll take this at home. That's how fast electronics change. Oh, yeah. And, and they allow you to write it off because yeah. it's going so fast in the head, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so that's... 
So, so now that's, that was the old fashioned way. But now we could buy the formula and, and design it in a very short period of time. Well, so we didn't have to make a master. A machine works but on digits. Yeah. And all it does is digits. That's kind of mind boggling, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so the guy, uh, so the factory man was demonstrating the machine. I said, boy, it's grunting. This machine is grunting. And, and the next time I come by, it's not grunting. And it, well, we, we slowed it down. We're, we were forcing the machine right. too much. And by the way, it's, uh, the grinding wheel is not a grinding wheel. It's a man-made diamond. Right. Yeah. And the diamond, man-made diamond is dressed by a real diamond. Uh, a light cut, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, uh, anyway, it's uh, Technology is something, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Now, most of these machines are sold to do one job all its whole life. Right. But ours, we have to switch it from one job to another. Sure. Well, so, you're a job shop, just like we are here. And uh, that's what takes the time, is uh, pretty programming it. How many different, uh, I mean, you over all these years, how many different masters do you have for cam profiles? Oh, uh, I get several hundred, but I'm not exactly sure. So, uh, oh, it's got to be more than several hundred. One thing I did do right at the beginning was uh, plot out the cam, uh, cam degrees, uh, crank shaft degrees, and I'd make a graph of the cam. That way, I, uh, the customer would send me what he's been using and how it run and what he wants. I could tell by his. Uh, you could overlay it. Mainly the intake opening diagram, how. Uh, uh, what I could do for him. Right. I, whether he wants more torque or more RPM and so forth. Because otherwise, if you just got the figures. That ain't good enough. Right. Oh, and by the way, uh, no one had a standard way of uh, checking the timing. Uh, you would have to call the camera and say, what, what's the checking clearance and what's the timing? Right. So uh, we noticed that as it rose up, once it got to 50,000 tap and rise, it was great velocity from then on. Right. So we started going by that. Rick, let's see what it's got from 50 to 50. 50 open, 50 closed. And, uh, and, and all this, uh, and sometimes it, this was a slow rep, a fast, that, 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 that's still the story. Well, and what you- We knew how much cam he had at 50, yeah. Well, and what you were doing with uh, the opening ramp- became a the 50 deal. Right. Well, you had pioneered that like you did a lot of other things. And, and but that opening ramp, then what you really were doing yeah. is taking the, if it was a gear, it was taking the backlash out of a gear. But in this case, you were taking the backlash out of the, out of the valve train. In other words, you were preloading yeah. the, the push rod and the rocker arm and the valve and all that sort of stuff. And you're getting it ready to take this aggressive ramp to open the, open and, and yeah. do its thing. So. And uh, by the way, this is the crank. It, it, it happens. The flywheel shook off. They must have known not known how to balance it. It, it shook off the oh, yeah. during the race in Indianapolis. Yeah. The Chevy crank with that type of crank. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you remember who those were? Just those guys. So, well, the, the first guy that We're ran a, a small block Chevy at Indy was Mickey Thompson yeah. in, in 1963. And then, uh, if you remember Ryan Faulkner, you know, Ryan, Ryan, Faulkner, sure. Ryan had the, the contract with GM to do that. And he built, you know, in, the, in those days, back in the early 1980s and that, the, the factories were involved in Indy and, and you had Buick, you know, and they had the V6s and the turbochargers and the, they had, oh, yeah. the, they had the 200 and, I think it was 202 cubic inches or 210 cubic inches for a push rod engine. Oh yeah. And, and so they did the V6s and so forth. And, oh and, yeah. And then of course the Offy, the turbo Offy, uh, they had 168 inches 
Right. And so you had the Turbo Offy running against the, the, the GM folks. Yeah. And SCAD at that time, we made all the cranks for uh, the Buick IndyCar program. V6. The V6, right. Uh -huh. Ray Cadroci and that old crowd. And uh, we won, in fact, there's a, a thing in the conference room. We won Indy with one of our crankshafts that, that uh, Menard. Menard, yeah. Who Menard is. They won, they're still involved in any racing today, but Menard was the, the top, you know, V6 Buick guy at the time. And we did a lot of that. And then they went into the V8s, and we're talking about a flat plane crank. We did um, the, the, the Nissan group. They went to Indy with uh, a regular 90 degree crankshaft. And all the other guys, the Oldsmobile crowd, if you remember at that time, Oldsmobile was involved. They went to Indy with a flat plane crank. And the first race that, of the season was at, at uh, Phoenix. And the guys from, from Nissan went over there. They went over there with their cars and they had 50 engines. And when they went home after the weekend, they had 50 broken engines. Really? <laughs> and they were using a 90 degree crankshaft, but the thing that they did wrong Besides that, because that crank had, you know, when you start turning 9,000, 9,500 and so forth, with having the throws off like that, the crank would shake like you're talking about and the flywheel would come off or it would break or whatever. But the real problem that they had was the oiling. And when we made those cranks, if you look at the oil system here, it's not the straight shot system. We drilled the, the, the cranks on this side and the oil galley ran the full length of the crankshaft. And I don't know if everybody can see it here, but at any rate, the oil does not come in from this side and cross over. It's always on the centrifugal side. So we could run these engines, we could run the engines at nine and 10 and 12 and whatever without starving oil. When you got a straight shot oil system, you're gonna lose all your oil pressure at about 9,500. And so that was one of the reasons why they lost all their engines. And Honowitz, I don't even remember Honowitz, he's still around who was head of the Nissan engine program, he told me that if I knew how to make crankshafts, that uh, maybe he'd think about things. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, that's, that's interesting. I said, uh, I don't know, but I think the cranks in the winter circle came out of here. He wasn't happy about that. So, anyway. I'll tell you some funny stories there. Mickey Thompson, Thompson comes to me. Oh, okay. There was a car running at Lamb's drag strip with two flatheads in it, and it went pretty good, but wasn't the fastest. And he buys that car and puts his Chrysler in it, uh, and, and Fritz Voices Chrysler in the back. Right. Now it's a two Chrysler car, and he said, then he has uh, Sorrell live at his house in Santa Monica, over there. Right. And, and build a streamlined body for it. It's a drag car. Right. But he's got to deal with the tire company. If you can go 300 or close to it, we will build you tires to do for that. 400 miles an hour. Okay. So they take this and they're going to Indianapolis for the big national drag race. Right. Let's stop at Bonneville on the way. <laughs> And by God, they go uh, with that streamlined body you now. They go about 290 miles an hour. Ooh. And uh, Fritz Boy says, "The hell with the uh, Indianapolis. Let's go home. We can't top this." So now he's got a promise to build a, a tire for 400 miles an hour. And he comes to me, and he has made connections with Pontiac. Which is uh, what's his name? So, uh, the the boss of Pontiac, and he went to Ford later. Uh, I know who you mean, but I. But anyway, I can't and remember. He loved Bob Mickey because it was diversion from the everyday running this big company. Yeah. So uh, he's uh, he's he, so Mickey comes to me. And I'm excited. Wow, are you coming to me? Yeah, I want you to build me six engine tour spares. I, you, no, I don't build the engine. I just supply 
the uh, cams and the rotor tappets and springs and stuff, and uh, six of those, and then you got to get me Mag Joe magnetos, four of those, and four fuel injections, naturally aspirated, because he wouldn't even do them, but I had to buy them, and I, and I thought, I think he could do it, I think he could do it, and he's got, well, he should, he's sort of bluffer, he bluffed, Oh, he well, he loved to gamble. I mean, you yeah. know, he but the he roulette. They were the best guys to do the job, to do the actual work. And that's what he would do. So I go to Vic Edelbrock Senior. Guess what I just promised to do? And I told him, Uh huh. Tell me something. Has the man ever bought anything from me before? He's never bought anything from me before. In fact, he's a Harmon and Collins man. I wonder why don't they help him? Uh, maybe they couldn't afford to or what? I don't know, but uh, so I, ex and later on into me, I exploited him to the hill later on to get my uh, advertising out of it, you know? Well, you marketing guys, you youngins, this is a lesson for you as far as giving away parts to racers. And if you're not buying from me, you don't get nothing. <laughs> and, you know, to spend money, and you're right, Ed, to spend money without having some money coming back, not a very good idea. No, that's right. Oh, here's another funny one. Mickey Thompson one day, come on, get in the car, it's advertising man, uh, and off they go fly to New York, uh, Detroit. So... Uh, why can't it? Lorenzen. No, not Lorenzen. And they know how to get up to the, uh, the boss's office in that Pontiac right. uh, without going through the formalities up the fire escape or something. <laughs> and then they barge in on him, and, and he has no appointment with Ricky. Right. Oh, sorry, fellows, uh, discussing problems in the shop. Uh, I, I forgot I had an appointment with Mickey, and he didn't really. And he kicked them all out. That's regular business, and because he loved Mickey Thompson, is is the president of the company like I used to be. He is a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah look back. Well, Mickey was a promoter. Promoter, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they yeah, talk. What's the trouble? For uh, uh, Fran Hernandez, who is not with Mercury and was an old Indy of uh, dry lakes racer. Won't give us the parts. What parts? Those engines. How did we, we I used to ask Fred Foyt, tell me, how did 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 you ever see any of the money that he gets Mickey gets from uh, Pontiac or Ford? No, he kept that all secret. <laughs> I got paid for everything I did and I just did what I was told and and he's lucky he had it because he was he could work on a dirt floor, any place, and do a good job yeah, with any yeah. emergency. So, uh, so, uh, well, so he's called, uh, I think it was Mercury that right. Fred Hernandez was with. Right, it was. You give him anything he wants, and you know what they would give him? They'd build a car, and the engine didn't run quite right. It had to come out, and another one went in, and then they had a lot of these that needed a little touching up. Some little part was the right, right? And the guy that does this is busy as hell. They, these are the ones they give Mickey Thompson, because they're, they're kind of off the books. No, no cash. And Mickey would turn it into cash when he went to LA. And what, did, what about transportation? Did the thing called salt press so press testing on trucks. Right. And they, they got to be destroyed after they've gone through this self test. Right. So you could use it, but you've got to bring it back. So after you're through with it, right. then we'll destroy it. Right. That was used to convert all these engines, which Mickey had turned into the cash back in California. <laughs> so that's the, well. way that, that's the way the money was. Because sending it, giving money by check, it was hard to do, but 
all these parts that are still good, just you know, fix it. That 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 could be written right off. You know? Well, those guys, um, when they destroyed cars, there were two wrecking yards or scrap yards in Detroit that got all of the cars out of the factories. And there's a, a car collection, Boydster, I think that's the way you pronounce it, who has all of the concept cars. The wrecking yard, one of the, the scrap yards, the guys were supposed to destroy those cars. And of course, they stuck them in a, in a barn or they took them apart and scattered the parts or whatever. But out of the woodwork, when you see the concept cars, those are all cars that, that were supposed to have been destroyed like you're talking about. But a lot of larceny happened, and when I, one of the things that I had, I had an inn at one of those places, and that's where I got a lot of the engines that I got, was when they destroyed these cars, they pulled the engine out, and they crushed the car and shredded it, and then oh, I got the engines. You remember me coming with my Ranchero by your shop, and I always had stuff in the back, and you always came out, and you looked at the truck, and you... And your memory is a steel trap, and you can look at a part and say, well, that's a of what it is. And that was, you never stopped looking at my truck. You always had something there that... Yeah. But one day I stumped you. If you remember going back a couple of years ago, you were walking through the Model T swap meet, and I was there with a load of my stuff, you know, my the old stuff, and you saw a tool that I had. A special tool. And you didn't know what it was, and I was... You had no idea how proud I was that day that I stumped you. It looked like this. I think they called it a scabbard off of a long sword. Right, right. The blade. Right. What? And, you, and, and I stumped you. Yeah, you, yeah, you said, me I bought that, and I said, that's a keepsake. Yeah, and I told you to go back at the donuts, or not the uh, hamburger stand, and take it to lunch with you, and show it to Nick Arias and see if he knew what it was. Did yeah. you ever do that? No, I didn't ever got to see it, but all six cylinder inline engines with a water pump up front pumping through one, two, three, four. That water's gonna be hot by the time it gets to sick. So they had a distribution tube and it looked like a scabbard on a sword and had holes in the right places to feed water from the water pump to each cylinder equally. Right. right. And that's what the flathead Ford V8 needed. It needed one of those. It didn't have it. Well, and this tool, what this tool was is, uh, and you engine rebuilders in the audience, and, you know that when you rebuild an engine, you got to pay attention to everything. And one of the, and these tubes were just steel, so they had a tendency to rust. Yeah, and, and this tool of yours went in there and and, and had the, and all quick, you pulled all it back, and it they went up and it out. got the tube back. And you didn't know what it was. That was <laughs> that was a good day. I mean, I put it on you for once. That was a good uh, test for people. Yeah. And I think they know what they're doing, yeah. You know, Ed, we've, we've uh, you know, shared a lot of, of our live experiences and so forth. And, but they actually... Uh, had me up here to talk about flat plane crankshafts, and so I let me let me take a second to to cover that so that everybody gets their money's worth because they wanted to hear about that. But the the basic thing is that the flat plane crank is to even the firing order so that you can use the exhaust system for tuning, and so it was a it's a way to get free power but also it posed certain problems as far as balancing is concerned. And of course, in the early days, everybody knew this, but everybody that, knew, that, that was in engine design knew what the issues were, but there wasn't anybody to make crankshafts, so nobody actually paid attention to it because it didn't matter because the only way you could fix it was to change the crank, and in the aftermarket, there wasn't anybody that could do that. And the first time that there was somebody that could do that, that could make a billet crankshaft economically, was when I bought that big machine back there, oh, yeah. and I could hog it out. So we started, you know, and the people that were in the know, no, and the people that didn't, didn't. And, By the uh, way, did you spoil one now and then? <laughs> we don't, well, yeah, you're right. The, the cutter body in that machine, it's 50 grand is what that cutter body is. And uh, my office is in that corner and the way the building is built, 
it's kind of like the Capitol building where one of the presidents, I don't know, this is a story of the history, that the Capitol, the dome on the Capitol, and I don't remember which president way back when, put his office in a particular position under that dome because he could hear then all of the senators plotting against him and so forth and so on. So my office is back there and the, the noise in the shop is transferred from there to there. Yeah. And so when the machines are running, it's the cash register going to tunk to tunk and it's a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and then with inflation, it's now a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. <laughs> but when it really goes kaboom, then I sit back in my chair and I think, uh-oh, this is a three scotch night. <laughs> because yes, we've destroyed things, of course we have. We don't talk about it, it's embarrassing, but whatever. Uh -huh. That's called R&D. And we, yeah, it's, yeah. R&D. R&D, yeah. Before I forget, there's a motorcycle. Gosh, I can't think of a Japanese motorcycle. There's this inline floor with that two plane crank in it. And they're selling them. Yeah. They like it, the exhaust sounds different, has a funny firing motor, too close together and too some far apart. Right. A crazy plane. And they like it. They they like the sound of it and they claim it has more torque off, off, off the line, off the, off the start. Yeah. Have you heard about it? Well, it, that works, but if you see those engines, or if you look at those engines, they're turning them 12,000, oh, yeah. 15,000 and stuff. So this is back to the theory about exhaust and, and the length of the pipe and so forth. Yeah. Because the exhaust gas is a mass, it takes time to go from point A to point B. Yeah. But when you're running at 10 and 12,000 RPM, the issues that you have velocity as far as it becomes narrower and narrower and narrower so they can get away with it. The things don't run worth a darn below seven, really. Mm -hmm. But at the upper range, they'll do that. So I think, uh oh, we've got hands out here. People want to ask a question. So we take questions? Okay, here we go. Yes, sir, you were first. Yes. What the gentleman has asked is if a flat plane crank improves the intake pulse. The whole purpose of a flat plane crankshaft is to equalize the intake pulse. Because remember, and Ed, you can back me up on this, the, the overlap on the camshaft, the intake valve opens before top dead center and the exhaust valve closes after. And the reason they do that is because the exhaust gas whistling out the exhaust port at 1,200, 1,500, 1,800 feet per second uh, jump starts the intake port. And so the problem with the collector, the whole purpose of the collector and the equal length pipes and all that is to get those pulses equal so that it will take that intake pulse and make it equal through all eight cylinders. Because right now, with your typical engine with the equal length header and so forth, there isn't that equal length pulse, so you've got four cylinders that are operating in, in sequence, and you got four cylinders that aren't. And the whole purpose of the crankshaft, the basic purpose, is to equalize the intake pulse. Yes, yes sir, you're absolutely right. Gentleman over here had a question. Thank you for your presentation. I just wonder how you start this business. What was the, your background? What? Are you referring to Ed or me or both? Both of them. Oh, well, I'll let Ed go first. Ed, the question was, how did you start your business? I mean, how did that happen? In other yeah. words, how many dollars did you All have right. in your pocket? All right, let me tell you about the early, early days. Uh, born in 21, Winfield was born in 01. Horse and buggy days. So he grew up as a kid seeing the first cars that were on the street there. Anyway, so now this is 21. He's racing uh, Model T's and winning. But anyway, because he was born in 01, 21, okay. By the time I'm riding bicycles and I'm 12 years old, it's 1933 or so over. And uh, how do we learn mechanics? On the way to school on Camp Box Day, we rummage through there and find appliances that are not working. 
we, we save those, take them apart. We can't put them back together, but we're learning how to take things apart. And on <laughs> what's step one. Time, <laughs> but in our neighborhood, with the bunk, two people in the bung holders club were in my neighborhood and had the, the hot rods. And you could learn from these older guys. So if you bought a bottle of tea in a, rec in a, yard, a lot sitting there for five or ten dollars, drag it home, they would come and help you get it running. And you'd learn from them, the older guys, five years older, you know. And they, and they told us, hey, you want to see a lot of these? Go to Murrow Dry Lake and run for top speed. A uh, hundred miles from Los Angeles, Murrow Dry Lake. And by the way, uh, you, uh, you can join this club or just hang out with the guys of this right. bug holders club. So what are you going to do? Oh, well, on weekends, some, once a month we go places, uh, little trips out to the desert or the mountains and come back. Oh, good, that's fun. And then if you want to see a lot of them, because we used to think there was only one or two in our neighborhood with a loud exhaust pipe, uh, uh, a little half-ass racing car, you yeah, mean, sure. out, of, out of the best you yeah. could do for the money. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, uh, so that's you started, what we learned. So you started with that. And it was good experience to screw stuff up and then done the hard way. Sure, so you started with that and you came up with some ideas. So then, then finally it comes a time I need a can because I've got a, a F head for a model, for a flathead, maxi heads, right. which are half intake, half exhaust. And I know I did a different cam for intake and exhaust. I go to Winfield and he takes pity on me and he must have laughed at what I'm doing. <laughs> but he had me, and he told me how- He humored you. Yeah, so he showed me his machine. No one else got to go in there hardly. Most people were at the front door uh, and they hand it through and yeah. And who were these guys? We call them the squirrels. Yeah. These are guys with a brand new Ford that got beat in a drag race somewhere and they want to get even. Right. <laughs> and they don't care about the knowledge of engines or anything. They just know that if you go to Winfield and get a you can go fast. Cam, I'll get even with that right. dirty guy from beating me. <laughs> so he, he so all they wanted was the cam and didn't want to know anything about engine. The money goes in the cam. Then he would try and get even with that guy that beat him. And that looked pretty good, didn't it? So that is, but, but if you were really wanting to learn, he would help you. He would help you well learn the basics and things like that. So that's that. So that's, uh, and then uh, so after the war, I uh, built a machine like he did. Because I learned uh, in the as an apprentice in a machine shop, and that was good. Know something about engines and machine work. They took the two, or you could just know nothing about machine work, but hire someone sure. to build it for you. Uh, so that, so that, so to do both. To do both. So basically, uh, in a nutshell, you had a passion to go fast. Yeah. You had this this curiosity of things that went puckety-puck, and if it moved, you wanted to know why. And I actually found out they needed me later on. They did. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I need I'm you today. You I'm helping the newcomers come into the sport with my little bit of experience I had before that. Exactly. Yeah. And if you want to know about me, it's pretty simple. I'm one of seven kids. My dad was a school teacher. We had no money, and I was a hot rodder. And uh, in those days, uh, like Ed is mentioning, the speed shop in the early days was the junkyard. That's where you found all your parts. Yeah. And so uh, I was working in a service station for a dollar and a quarter an hour and trying to build my hot rod. And uh, guys would come to me and they wanted to know where I got this part or that part. And uh, I figured out pretty quick that I knew where the parts were in these different scrap yards. And so I figured out that I could buy it for 10 bucks and sell it for 20, and that was better than working for a dollar and a quarter. And then in the middle of all that, I got fired from the service station 
because I could never show up to work on time because I was out hustling somebody's parts. And so I figured out real quick in my life at about 16 that if I was going to survive, I better figure out something other than working for somebody because the, my impression of employers in those days, which was one, was they weren't very friendly to employees because the guy had the audacity to fire me because I didn't show up to work on time. <laughs> so I borrowed my mother's, we had a 53 Ford station wagon. And I borrowed my mother's station wagon from time to time to put the parts in and deliver. And of course, she was always upset with me because flathead. That's a flathead. that was a flathead. It was yeah. a great car. And uh, but I always brought it back. I tried to clean it up, but how do you clean it up after you spill a couple of quarts of oil in the back? And you know, she was not sympathetic to my endeavors. So I ended up. I bought a '57 Ford Ranchero, and uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. So, but um, anyway, any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, I want to say congratulations on a long, productive life. And my question is, when is your 101st birthday? Ah. When was that? When, the question is, when's your 101st birthday? July 10th. July, July 10th. 10th. Yeah. Well, I'm going to. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I don't hear good and don't see good now, but. By golly, at 99, I was a lot better shape. <laughs> <laughs> well, at 70, I was too, but uh, anyway, any other questions? Did we cover the flat plane crank? Did that give you the idea of why it exists? Um, so is that the new hot ticket then? <laughs> well, that's the new hot ticket. Now, we uh, to put a little, uh, the, the real, benefit of this is not increasing horsepower, it's taking and flattening the torque curve. And so torque, if you remember, torque head is where the cylinder head runs out of air, and there's a torque, peak torque happens when, when air is maximized by the cylinder head and camshaft and everything, right? Yeah. And so what happens if you can take, and this gentleman asked the question about the, the intake pulse, if you can take and make eight equal intake pulses, then you've got eight cylinders working in conjunction with each other, which means you can move the torque curve to a flatter plane. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole, the whole idea, is to level out the torque curve and make it last longer. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to tell you this about Smokey Eunuch. Okay. Yeah. All right. Everybody loves to hear about Smokey. Going back to the races at, at the beach, you know, half on the beach and half on the Palmetto Road. Right, the early days. Way, the old way. Right. And um, Smokey has now left Chevrolet is with, with uh, Ford now. Right. So I come to him at, at, in Daytona Beach. Uh, I'm going to watch the races, see the races, and meet old friends. Iski says, uh, how do you get the engine to use more fuel? Well, he's tricking me. I didn't know, I didn't know, but he's tricking me. You can smell a rat. And I said, well, you can richen it up a little bit, but wait a minute, I, if you richen it up, it might not like it, it might slow down, maybe it won't drink as much fuel. I said, you gotta have more air in order to use more fuel. Right. The cab and the ports and all help that. And that's all he said. And I got the thing after he would he's testing me to see if I know anything at all. And he, he must do that with all the engine builders and guys that have reputation. That's the way he tests them in a roundabout way. They don't they they don't know they're being tested. Right. right. About uh, Well that's, stuff. that's the way we interview people for employment, by the way. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so one thing about this sport that's great is uh, you get a little experience, you're helpful to new guys that come in because the older guys helped you and now you can help them and they even get paid for doing certain things sometimes and all that. Ed, I'm an example of that. You've, you, you've helped me through my whole life. And thank you. So, uh, 
You've, uh, Here's what I heard. Smokey is in the Chevrolet's office cooling his heels for three days with that famous guy that used to run and got killed in an airplane accident. I forget his name. And what he really made him mad, he owed. Dick, uh, F Bill France comes in past the secretary and goes right into the president's office after he'd been waiting there three days to see it, and that's what he left Chevrolet and went to Ford, and they took him right away. Well, there you go. Uh, he, uh, it's called customer service. <laughs> By the way, uh, here we are in California, we're thinking no one can make any inroads with uh, the factories back east, Chevy, Ford, Chrysler. Oh, yeah, they won't talk to you. But by God, if you were persistent, you could get to talk to those guys. By God, and, well, Mickey did it. Yeah, well, uh, there was a lot of larceny in the early, in the early uh, days. <laughs> Uh, so that, it could be done. Yeah. Now let me tell you another funny story. <laughs> you all go, you, you've heard of a Tabo car, uh, Tabo Lago? Tabo Lago. Beautiful right. car. A uh, streamlined French car. I didn't know this at first, but the Lago is an Italian guy that builds a hemi head that'll go on a, a six-cylinder car with a push rod down one side, and it'll look, instead of a, uh, like a BMW has a, two push rods and an extra rock rod right. for a Hemi, right. he, he just put a long exhaust rod there. Right, okay. Which worried some people to death. And, but they weren't good. Yeah. And that was a, a Lago head, because you could buy a Tabo without that head, you just have a Tabo, uh, a Chevrolet six type engine, right? But the Lago would give you a Hemi. That was the upmarket. So uh, guess what? Duntoff is in Europe, and he knows about these sports cars and Lago, and so that's where he got his idea. So he 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 says that Chevy V8 flat is a pretty good engine, but it gets hot. And would make a good truck engine if we made an overhead valve head for it. And why not use a Lago type head? That heavy with a long right. Uh, yeah. So he so he makes that after the war. Uh, for only four hundred dollars, you could buy a set. Amazing. And the things were done pretty cheap in those days. And uh, so for Oldsmobile and Cadillac come out with their V8 overhead valve, nineteen forty nine. Right. And uh, that killed his idea for the truck business for that. Uh, but the hot riders love that. Uh, oh, yeah. With their flat head to, to make it into a Hemi. So, where are we? Oh, so, guess what? Chrysler is going to come out with a V8. But let's take our time. Uh, we'll come out in 1951. Right. And uh, so they. They got engineers, they just hired new guys reading Hot Rod magazine. <laughs> For the first time, the engineers... They paid attention. Are, ...are reading Hot Rod magazine, because there was no Hot Rod magazine before that. Right. And here, engineering, Chrysler Engineering, with their foot, they're cooking ahead a, an Oldsmobile block, just a block. And under each arm is a Duntop head. What we need is that kind of bond, <laughs> bond with this kind of head. So that was our heavy. It cost them a fortune to make that big heavy motor. Right. For, what, almost 10 years? They, that was expensive. And they didn't need it. All they needed was a wedge engine for a simple, for Patrick. Because that engine was good when I got in the wrecking yard for the drag racing guys. Oh yeah, well that was yeah. the, the standard, and it, it's the standard today too. Yeah. You know, the new version of it. But. So that was, uh, so there was those guys reading Hot Rod Magazine that 
kind of convinced them they need a Hemi V8. Yeah. Which I, is good for racing, but they didn't need it for a passenger car. Ed, are you hungry? Uh, not quite. Well, whatever. I I'm, talk to you about. I, I'm looking at the clock, and it's uh, quarter to 12, and I guess the, uh, is the lunch truck here, or the, the taco guy's here? Yeah, it's all ready. It's ready to go outside. Yeah. It, it's, it's time to, to uh, cut it off, uh, and... You know, the lunch truck is there. Uh, would go out and grab yourself a taco. Uh, I'll be in the shop, and Mike, where's Mike? There's Mike over there, his hand raised. Anybody that uh, wants to go through the shop and take a look at the different machines and talk to us about how we do things here, um, we'd love to have you do that because this place is, is unique in itself. Uh, I've spent, you know, the 50, 60 years of my life developing how to make crankshafts. And of course, in, in my estimation, the world according to Tom, the crankshaft is the hardest thing in the world to make. And I've made everything except pistons because that's just too easy. So <laughs> the, the uh, uh, machinery that we have is dedicated to crankshafts. It's a shop that you probably would not have an opportunity to go, well, at least on the West Coast do not have an opportunity to go into and we have some unique stuff. We have, where's George? Is George? Okay, we have, we called in one of our guys, the machine that I talked about that cost more than this building, uh, we fired up for you today for you to take a look to see how awesome that thing is. It weighs 60,000 pounds, it's four feet in the ground, it has 100 horsepower on demand, uh, and it eats metal for lunch. And so we thought it would be an interesting thing for you guys to see because this is the only opportunity that you'd ever be able to see that. And this is kind of the heart of the business here. We have two of those machines. We have two crank lines. Uh, and then we have, of course, the connecting rod line and so forth and so on. So we'd be glad to share that with you and help yourself as far as walking through the shop and I'll be out there. Uh, Ed's gonna be around, I guess, for a little bit. And we're having tacos for lunch, is that okay? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. And I've got hot sauce. Is that good? Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Would you guys tell me, I can't, can't keep forgetting the name of the president of uh, Pontiac, who later became president of Ford. Who, what was his name? Knudsen? Huh? Knudsen? Knudsen, yeah, Knudsen. You're the winner. Yay. Give him a t-shirt. Give him a t-shirt. This man uh, needs a t-shirt. So, uh, so, uh, so when Mickey goes to get those engines and all that stuff he's going to take home from the factory, uh, Fran Hernandez, the old hot rod guy from New York Dry Lake, who now works for Mercury and Ford, wouldn't give it to him. So he went back to uh, Newton and said, uh, we're having a dribble. He calls up Brandon and Anna and says, give him anything he wants. And by God, this time he got loaded up and got the transporter and everything to all that stuff with you. Give him it, anything he wants. See it. You know, <laughs> so he was holding back. You know, the, the uh, performance industry is an industry that um, is made up of, of just guys that have a passion for for speed, they're competitors, uh, they're guys that don't take no for an answer. And you know, it's it uh, has developed into a gazillion dollar industry. And you know, myself personally, I've had a good run in, in the, the, uh, the benefits to my life and my family and so forth has been spectacular. What are you gonna do in retirement? I'm going to hang out with Ed. <laughs> By the way, and, uh, when we used to comb the junkyards for Model T parts in the Model T uh, section, all the engine parts, we would sometimes speed equipment, find aftermarket speed equipment for Model T's yep. in with the Model T parts. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I found three aluminum rods aftermarket for a Model T. But not the fourth. Oh, what? what? Where, where the, it must have gone bad. Do so you I, still have those rods? I should have saved those, bought those three for a pig's sake. I may have that. 
<laughs> so, so here we are, Jim Garns is coming to Bakersfield for $1,500 toll money, pay, pay uh, appearance money, and also cars are coming from back east and being get gas money in uh, Drag News Magazine. So uh, Bert Rooney, a tool maker from Oklahoma, comes and he says, See my uh, 37 Chevy out there? I got an old mobile V8 in with a top bottle of GMC blower on top, and I got aluminum rods in that. You're a kid. <laughs> aluminum rods, you know. You want to see one? Well, yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> and he showed it. Oh, I was a man. Oh, this beautiful bee. My, do you mind if I trace this on a piece of paper? Sure, go ahead. And if you want to make them, go ahead. I don't want to make any more. So we get our tool maker to make about 10 cents. And we sold about five cents. And we lent out, lent out, uh, which you never get back, <laughs> to these drag racers. And we don't know that this will be the coming thing. We don't know that. Because the stock rocks would hold up for a few runs, the stock steel run. As I did rock before, you need that soft aluminum to cushion that nitro glow. Uh, uh, it's good. good. That's the way it works. Yeah, I'll be done. Don't do it. So, uh, okay. Well, now it, we got into the aluminum rod business. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what happened. Then the aluminum rod became standard, yeah. Well, you know, the. You've always been ahead of the of the curve, you know. You, yeah. You know, you find out later that. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I forget. Oh, yeah. I forget. There's one thing. There's some stuff made for old cars that isn't used anymore. And if you bring it back again, it looks like something new. There you go. <laughs> we don't tell the people in the magazine ad that. You're the inventor of it. You just did it, and it looks like you invented something. But but you. But then look around. If you don't mind, take, I'll take the credit. But sure. and, you know, and, and that would happen in the a, a model. You oh, we'd like to love to watch a mechanic work at the gas station, and we learn by watching him yeah. working in that greasy old car, an old first first six cylinder Chevy. And you look, what, what is that he's throwing away? He's throwing away some springs that are pressurizing the push rod against the lifter on a flat tablet cam. And he's also got a spring on the valve. Oh, I never saw that before. There, here comes your rev kit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and so that little helper spring, and he'd throw them away because they're all dirty and they don't need them anyway. And we didn't know the GMC diesel had it done even better. So, so I'm, I'm thinking of putting that on my prototype at camp. And one of my customers calls up, why don't you put a little helper spring on that? Uh, hey, I better hurry up. These guys know about that. <laughs> uh, it, it looks like I invented something, but I'm not going to say I invented something, but it looked like it. It looked good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So that's what that. Well, we've had. I hope. I hope you've had fun. Uh, had fun. And, uh, thank you all for coming. Lunch is served. Um, and here we are, Ed. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Make sure everybody thank takes the time to uh, visit God the vendors outside. Everyone that's taking the time to come here, please. Do you know, do you know about that motorcycle with that? Yeah. 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 What's it have more torque down though or some funny thing? Some funny sound to the motorcycles. Digging up the uh, oh, my camera. Like a like a five hundred inch uh, single has a lot of torque. You run out the clutch is when you go five hundred inch twins, try it. You gotta give it a little gas or it'll kill the motor. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Edward, Good. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Now, what it means to be is how you find the good men to work for you. We do that. We have a homeless camp yeah, across the street. <laughs> and they only can stay there for two weeks. So, so I know when they're coming out because I see them every day. Oh, yeah. We, we, we put the hook on them. All right. Here's your drink. Here's your drink. I got your seven up. Got to go to El Mirage more often. Uh, this is a drink. Open yes. it yesterday. I know.